Hi everyone, we just can give it a couple of moments for people to join. Um, as I said in the first session, or if this is your first session of the day, please feel free to keep your cameras on. This is an interactive session. Um, you'd be able to interact with our with our panelists today. So um, don't be shy, keep your cameras on. Um, so um, I hope you have been enjoying the discussions today on some of the other streams we've had this morning. Um, we are moving on to our second interactive roundtable session of the day within our age and science track, where we will be discussing what has COVID taught us about the biology of aging. Um, as I mentioned just at the beginning, because there's still few people joining, feel free to keep your cameras on. This is an interactive session, um, but please, if you could mute yourself, um, just so we can kind of make sure that everyone can be heard when the presenters are given their um, short introductions and presentations in the beginning of the session. If you do have any questions, we feel free for you to actively engage with this discussion as it is a round table. Um, you could ask them, ask them directly in the chat function, which you can find at the bottom of your screen, or you could ask it directly by raising your hand, which you can find in the reactions button. Um, that way you can ask that to our panelists live and join the discussion. So that's enough from me. I'm gonna hand over to Ne, who is the director from the Institute of Aging from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Thank you, Ne. Uh, thank you, Jade. And uh, it's good morning uh, for Jim Kirkland at the Mayo Clinic where it's eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, I'm in New York, it's nine o'clock in the morning here. And Janet is uh, in Birmingham or, uh, and so it's when? It's good, good afternoon to you. Um, and one of the things, this clock had nothing to do with our interaction during COVID because we work 24 hours a day. And uh, COVID actually was an opportunity uh, for our field. So let me just start by making one statement uh, before we go in the discussion. I, I'm, I'm looking and I'm seeing some people I know, most of you I, didn't, I don't know, so I don't know where are you coming from, but there's one thing that you have to know, <laughs> that um, aging has biology, of course you know that, you know who's old and who's young, but that this biology drives the diseases of aging, and that this biology is flexible, and we've been able to target aging and delay it and stop it in some instances and reverse it in some other instances. And so we can do a really much better and we have many more opportunities uh, to go on. Uh, let me introduce a, a, a slide uh, because after all, um, the title uh, of our uh, of this symposium has to do with COVID also. And I just want to, you to pay attention to this slide that takes you from China to Italy, to the, U, to the US, to the UK, and it doesn't matter. It shows exactly the same thing. If you're over the age of 80, your chances of dying are 180 fold more than if you're at the age of 20. This happens not only uh, for COVID, it happens from almost uh, every other disease, the diseases that we care and we suffer from, from Alzheimer's, from cancer, from diabetes, from heart disease. Uh, this virus that has no eyes knows exactly how to target uh, the elderly. So with this in mind, I want to turn to uh, Janet and ask you to give your thoughts on, a, on a, what, 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 what else should we know about the demographic hit of the virus? And, and are there agents that in your mind or have shown to modulate a, the disease? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't introduce, except saying that they are colleagues and friends, I didn't say anything about Janet and James, but their bio, is out there, so I'll 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 cut that. Uh, I'll just say they're they're so prominent in our field, and it's just great to uh, interact with them. And I hope you'll enjoy what they have to say. So, Janet, please take it away mm -hmm. and tell us what 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 can we learn about demography and treatment. Okay, thanks, Nia. 
So I'm based at the University of Birmingham and I'm the director of the Institute of Inflammation and Aging. And so Nia has already introduced some of the demographics, but I want you to think about what the virus has told us about aging and particularly the aging of the immune system. So if you think about the job of the immune system, it has to detect and kill pathogens. It must be able to do that without uh, destroying ourselves, so no autoimmunity. It must be able to develop immune memory so that when we see the pathogen again, we react better. And that's the basis of vaccinations. And it must also be able to detect and kill um, early cancerous cells. So, so what's the evidence? What has the virus told us about our immune systems in old age? Well, as Nia said, um, it's really identified the old and also the younger people who may have accelerated aging because they've got chronic conditions already, even at a younger age. So this is the uh, data from the UK for susceptibility to infection, males on the uh, left, uh, females on the right. And you can see, as Nia showed, this really marked um, age related increase in the chances of you succumbing to SARS-CoV-2. And in fact, over 90 percent of the cases in the UK are for the over 60 year olds. But that's not enough. So your immune system doesn't work as well, doesn't stop you from getting for the infection. But it's worse than that. When you get the infection, the older you are, the sicker you are. So here again for disease severity, this is patients requiring a low level of care on the left and those admitted to uh, critical care to ICU. And again, you can say really marked um, age related increases in even those that required low level hospital care, but critical care, even more of a marked effect and particularly for men. So you're sicker. And the chances are, of course, that you've got an increased risk of death as well. So again, um, much more deaths in the older age groups. What about the other element then, this uh, ability to uh, tackle pathogens but not harm yourself? So these are data from just healthy elderly. So as you get older, your ability to um, not uh, produce autoantibodies declines. So these are healthy elders, and this is an autoantibody called rheumatoid factor. So these people are not sick, but they've got this predisposition to make autoantibodies, which increases the risk, uh, uh, risk of diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis. So what did coronavirus reveal? Well, these are some data from a nice paper from Aaron Ring, and they've looked for autoantibodies uh, at the time of acute infections. At Birmingham, we've done similar studies three months later and found similar data. Here on the left, you can see that this is the number of antibodies, autoantibodies the patients have. And if the ones with severe disease, you can see that when you top this up, over 60% had some form of autoantibody. Um, and you know this was related to the severity of the disease. And in mouse studies, this group showed that these autoantibodies were disease causing. So they picked out one that was particular, it was an autoantibody to interfere on, and they gave the mouse a uh, uh, coronavirus and the mice were sicker if they had this autoantibody present and they also died more quickly. So your uh, immune system doesn't protect you and it also has this predisposition to make autoantibodies, which may well explain a lot of the disease and death associated. So this is just pulling this all together. So when you have an immune response, you have two stages. You have the innate element, the very rapid response, and this has macrophages and neutrophils. And then you, you have your adaptive response, uh, the T cells and the B cells making antibodies and protecting you long term. And what we found out is when you looked at the patients who recovered well from their infection, that their immune systems had progressed from the innate to the adaptive. They got this developed response. The patients who did badly or died, their immune systems got stuck in this stage. They had lots of these macrophages and neutrophils in their lungs. And the problem is these cells, unfortunately, release lots of damaging agents like proteases. So how does understanding aging biology help us to come to cures, which is what Nia suggested. So this is some data we did a while ago now thinking about, well, how does your immune system cause damage as you get older? And one of the things that happens is the immune system, uh, the cells move from the blood to the site of infections, so this in case the lungs. But to do that, they release proteases and they damage tissue along the way. And we showed even in healthy elders, so this is young and old adults, this is how well they're able to move in any direction. But what happens with age is your neutrophils don't move in the correct direction. They wiggle around a lot and they cause a lot more damage. 
So when we measure damage, this is a measure of tissue damage caused by neutrophils. It's twice as high in the old people as the young people. And this causes this increased tissue damage and inflammation. So this is why you're sicker. We went into why and we showed that this is due to an overactive PI3 kinase delta signaling system. And very nicely, this can be inhibited by statins. So in a trial of patients with pneumonia, we gave them statins for just seven days and found that compared to a placebo, the patients with the statins, their chemotaxis, this movement of the neutrophils improved. And more importantly, the damage caused by the neutrophils declined. Their disease scores declined with the statins. And most importantly, we followed these patients out for a year and these are the patients on the placebo at the bottom and the statin at the top. And we dropped the deaths by 40%. And now statins are in trial now in the UK in a platform called HEAL to uh, try and improve outcomes for, for patients. So just before they're released from hospital, they're, they're giving a statin. We don't know the outcome yet. That trial has only been going a few weeks but that it might help is suggested by this data. This is a, a paper from Zhang in, last year, comparing deaths in statin users versus non-statin users, and the COVID-19 deaths were lower in the statin users, and their inflammation in these bottom graphs was also lower. So it suggests that this aged immune system really is problematic. I'm just going to finish by saying it's not all bad news. So a lot of the immunologists, we were predicting that older adults wouldn't develop a really good response to the COVID vaccines. Um, and these are data from tetanus. And essentially they're showing you that the older you are, the less antibody you make response to uh, a vaccination. But in this data just published from uh, my colleague, Helen Parry and Paul Moss here in Birmingham, they've shown that in 100 care home residents, uh, average age 84 years, that actually they produced a good response. This is to the Pfizer vaccine in both the antibodies and in their T cell response was much higher. And interestingly, those that were in blue here, these are the guys that had already had COVID and survived it, and they produced an even better response. So I think all in all, understanding the biology of aging and particularly what happens to your immune system with age can hopefully help us to try and improve um, how we tackle uh, infections such as COVID. Uh, and I'll stop there. Uh, terrific, uh, Janet, and, and thanks for that. I, I think we'll go back uh, to the vaccination, but this is really very reassuring. I mean, no matter how we look at it, it looks like the vaccination is effective in, in the elderly. The, yeah. the, the, the challenge for me is that you have shown that almost at any, ch any um, stage of the immune response, the adaptive uh, um, and, and the responsive, uh, it's declining the elderly. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the, the vaccine is using basically the same mechanism. So, I'm really happy it works, but I don't totally understand uh, why. Yeah, I don't, we don't. I mean, the best guess is that there's something about that spike protein that the, um, the immune cells do react really well to, no matter what age you are. We know that the older you get, you have less of these naive T cells because the thymus shrinks and that's why you tend to react less well to vaccines, but it, it just may be fortunate that um, the spike protein and perhaps the adjuvants used in the vaccines as well, and managing to really stimulate even the older person's immune system. And, and do the antibodies, are, are the antibodies showing up after vaccination too? Yeah, they are. So the, the left hand graph was the antibodies, the right hand was the T cells. And in, um, you know, 63% of the um, care home residents developed a good T cell response. So they've got the cellular bit and 98% and developed protective antibodies. So they, they did really well. What we don't know yet is how long the antibodies are going to hang around, of course. Uh, and that's the other problem with the aged immune system. The, the immunity doesn't last, but we'll see what happens. Terrific. Um, so I, I just want to remind those of you who haven't heard or, or those of you who haven't heard it before, um, we are Gero scientists. We are uh, trying to develop Gero therapeutics or uh, to look at Gero protect protectors. And our all field depends on the fact 
that we agree on hallmarks of aging. Now, what's hallmarks of aging? How do you become hallmark of aging? If there's some biology that changes with age and you target it in models, in animals, and it delayed aging, stopped aging, reversed aging, you become a hallmark. Now, uh, each one of us has a little different slide. You know, it started with uh, seven hallmarks in the United States and nine hallmarks in uh, Europe. And then there was Brexit. So we have eight and everyone has a different version. Uh, this version here is different in the sense that um, because of COVID, I exchanged one of those two immune dysfunction and uh, we always had inflammation or inflammaging, which Janet just talked about, the decline in immune uh, uh, dysfunction. She showed that statin might reverse some of it, and she talked a, lot, a little bit about uh, inflammation. But the interesting thing in those hallmarks, and those hallmarks created this opportunity for biotechs to form a, a, around them. And, and the interesting thing is you don't have to target all those hallmarks to have any effect. In fact, you can target one of them and have different effects. And I think that um, Jim is going to, talk, to take us through one of the hallmarks and I'm not going to talk about the others and really take us through and see how targeting one of the hallmarks had so much, so many effects and also make it relevant to the COVID. So take it away, Jim. Thanks, I'll just uh, share my screen. Yeah, so as Nir said, you, there are hallmarks of aging. People can slice and dice them into various groups. I think very simply, much more simply than Nir, who I'm delighted to meet for the first time, my and uh, and heard a lot um, about I've heard a lot about you too. Some some things good. Well, uh, there's there's the other side too. We won't go into that. But yeah. uh, we, we at always any rate, <laughs> these these um, hallmarks. Uh, I like to think simply and divide them into four categories. As um, Janet was talking about. Um, uh, and near uh, one of the hallmarks can be inflammation, which tends in at sites of age-related phenotypes to be chronic, low-grade, and sterile. That is, it occurs in the absence of apparent infection and is associated with fibrosis. There are a lot of changes that occur in macromolecules like DNA and proteins and sugars and uh, large lipids and organelles within cells. There are problems with stem cell and progenitor uh, function, and cellular senescence is another hallmark. We've developed something we call a unitary theory of fundamental aging processes, and that's that these processes are all highly interlinked. And uh, it's becoming increasingly clear, as I'll mention later, that if you target one of these fundamental aging processes, you impact all of the rest, usually in a positive direction. Uh, and these, as Nir mentioned, these hallmarks appear to be upstream of the geriatric syndromes, that things like age-related muscle loss and frailty and immobility, uh, the chronic diseases uh, for which age itself is by far the biggest risk factor. 80% of your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease can be predicted from your chronologic age alone. And also decreased resilience, that is decreased capacity to recover after surgery or from an infection. So um, senescent cells are cells that accumulate with aging they can occur at any point during life uh, from uh, conception on. They occur across the vertebrates. Uh, they um, uh, are a cell fate. So that cellular senescence is a cell fate, much like differentiation or cell proliferation or programmed cell death. Uh, it's one of, one of the cell fates, but it takes a lot longer to become completely established than the other cell fates. So from induction, it takes uh, 10 days to six weeks for a cell to become fully senescent, very slow. Senescent cells are very resistant to dying. They're normally cleared by the immune system. And this just shows that senescent cells accumulate even in healthy individuals with increasing age because these are fat tissue samples taken from people who are donating a kidney. So by definition, they're healthy. 
And we can see that senescent cells accumulate with age, uh, especially after, at some point after age 60, uh, somewhere between 60 and 80, people tend to develop an exponential increase in their senescent cell burden in multiple tissues. It's very difficult, by the way, to say that a cell is or is not senescent. These cells tend to be larger than normal cells. Uh, they produce, some of them produce what we call a senescence-associated secretory phenotype, around 30 to 70% do. We call those deleterious senescent cells, and the other senescent cells are what we call helper senescent cells that don't have this SASP, or senescence-associated secretory phenotype. The SASP entails production of a lot of inflammatory mediators. It uh, involves production of chemokines that attract, anchor, and activate immune cells. Uh, and uh, it also involves production of tissue damaging pro proteases, uh, factors that cause fibrosis, and factors that spread senescence even at a great distance, as I'll mention in a moment. It's very hard to come up with uh, precise markers of senescent cells. Uh, usually you have to use a combination of them. Uh, and uh, so there's sometimes debate about what is and what isn't a senescent cell. There are no markers that are completely sensitive and specific. So senescent cells also occur in younger people, like this 33-year-old uh, woman on the right in her adipose tissue with obesity and diabetes. They can occur in children, uh, say after chemotherapy or radiation or in certain um, uh, 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 disease states. So they can occur at any point during life. Senescent cells um, have, we, you don't want to interfere with their production because they can be beneficial. They're necessary during uh, fetal development. They form in the placenta and they help to drive the baby through the birth canal because of the factors they produce. Uh, they can form uh, in response to cancerous mutations and act sort of as like demon seed in the middle of a cancer by producing factors that kill the cells around them. And the cancerous cells that become senescent themselves stop dividing essentially irreversibly, although it's looking like some of them can escape that, uh, pretend, potentially contributing to tumor recurrence. Uh, but you do want to get rid of senescent cells after they've done their job, especially the 30 to 70% that have a SAS. So there are conditions where they accumulate. Now, if you transplant very small numbers of senescent cells into a middle-aged animal, for example, such that only one in 10,000 cells in that animal is senescent, that is sufficient to cause the animal to become frail and after a lag period to die early, and they die early of all age-related diseases. Uh, and you have to achieve a threshold though. If it's below that threshold, nothing much happens. If it's above that threshold, senescent cell burden amplifies and you get these problems. And part of the reason for this is that um, uh, senescence um, uh, spreads. So if you transplant senescent cells into younger animals, uh, they, they will spread. Also, um, um, uh, they, they, they spread in a, both a paracrine and an endocrine manner. So if you transplant senescent cells such as they're only in the abdomen, you find the recipient's own cells start becoming senescent in their arms and legs. So one of the things we decided to do uh, based on all of this is determine if there's a way of getting rid of senescent cells. And we spent years at it after an important paper came out in 2004 by Ned Sharpless, who's now director of the National Cancer Institute in the US, showing that food restriction, which increases health span, also delays senescent cell accumulation. That led us on a search to try to find drugs that would kill senescent cells. We got nowhere for a long time. Then it hit us in early May, 2013, uh, that we should use a hypothesis-driven approach. Senescent cells, the ones that have a SASP, the bad ones, kill cells around them, but they themselves survive. So we wondered why that happened. And you see a similar thing with certain kinds of leukemias and lymphomas. So we figured senescent cells might have similar mechanisms to prevent themselves from committing suicide. And what we did was we looked for pro-survival pathways using bioinformatics approaches, uh, and we found them. And this is... a. Uh, uh, the network of pro-survival pathways that can defend senescent cells against their own SASP, cell-killing SASP. Uh, we found originally five pathways, and it turns out there's a network now of at least nine pathways. So different kinds of senescent cells depend on different elements of these pathways. 
Sometimes they're redundant. Uh, we showed this by uh, knocking down key nodes on the pathways using RNA interference. And we found that some human cell types that were senescent were killed by knocking down certain nodes on the pathways and others were killed by knocking down others. We, based on this, we predicted uh, uh, um, using, again, going back to the computer, that there'd be certain drugs that would target multiple nodes on these pathways and would kill particular senescent cell types. We found that to be the case. We found about 30 drugs that the computer spat out. They all turned out to be senolytic. We focused on ones that were already in human use and have a short elimination half-life because what we wanted to do was develop ways of treating of clearing senescent cells in a hit and run manner, knowing that it takes, um, you know, 10 days to six weeks for new senescent cells to form. We wondered if we could briefly disrupt these pro-survival networks and allow senescent cells to kill themselves. And we wanted to use short acting drugs in a hit and run manner. Uh, one of the drugs I'll talk about is uh, desatinib. Uh, it kills the 30 to 70% of senescent fat cell progenitors that have a SASP. Another I'll talk about is carcetin. It's in apple peels, makes them taste bitter, natural product. It will kill senescent endothelial cells, uh, but not creatocytes. And we predicted that. And so we combined them in some of our trials. Another drug that we um, found is senolytic is closely related to carcetin. It's called fizetin, and it's currently in clinical trials for COVID. So these agents, if you give them to mice that have had transplanted senescent cells transplanted, you kill the 30 to 70% of senescent cells that have a SASP, you leave the helper senescent cells alone. Uh, we're able to alleviate frailty in the, in the uh, transplanted animals, the younger animals. Uh, uh, we were able to prevent them from developing frailty and early death if we clear the senescent cells that have been transplanted. If we treat older animals, with senolytics were able to alleviate frailty and multiple conditions, over 50 of them now, in various mouse models of disease. Now, the kinds of things that induce senescence include uh, the other pillars of aging, notably immune cells. Uh, Janet mentioned neutrophils. Neutrophils profoundly drive cells into senescence because of the reactive oxygen species they produce. Conversely, senescent cells chemoattract neutrophils. So they produce factors that attract, anchor, and activate neutrophils. The same with macrophages. So uh, senescent cells produce many factors that attract macrophages, activate them into an M1 state, and in turn, macrophages cause senescent cells to form. And macrophages also have a, something on them called CD38. Uh, it is an enzyme which breaks down NAD. Senescent cells activate macrophage CD38, then macrophages break down NAD, so another pillar of aging is activated. Conversely, low NAD causes cells to become senescent. Furthermore, senescent cells, particularly virally induced senescent cells or senescent cells that have been exposed to viral antigens, produce factors that attract T lymphocytes, especially IP10. And this may account for the T lymphocyte deficiency that we see in people with coronavirus infection because these senescent cells are attracting them. PAMPs or pathogen activated uh, uh, molecular pattern factors can cause cells to become senescent. So things like lipopolysaccharide made by bacteria and things produced by viruses can make a cell become senescent and can activate existing senescent cells to have a more profound SASP. Uh, we showed in early trials that in humans with these drugs I mentioned, intermittent dosing, just a couple of days of three days of dosing is sufficient to reduce senescent cell burden in adipose tissue, like in that young woman that I showed you earlier. And we developed uh, blood markers of senescent cells based on these studies. And we found that senolytics, even in a very small trial of only nine subjects, substantially reduced a panel of SAS factors, uh, some of which are, or all of which are closely related to immune function. We found in people with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, a senescence-related disease, that we're able to alleviate frailty. But this is a very early open phase one trial. We have to repeat that in, in a double-blind trial. So we have a couple of trials underway for coronavirus. Uh, one of them is in acute hospital patients. It's uh, accrued 49 patients. Our goal is to get 70. So I don't know what the results are going to be. 
and it's to try to see if we can improve oxygenation status and so forth. And this is based on extensive um, cell culture and preclinical data in experimental animals with coronavirus infection, indicating that these agents um, reduce mortality, uh, that senolytic agents reduce mortality, but I don't have time to go into those studies. And um, so this trial is also looking at to see if we can prevent long haulers and so forth. We have another trial that's going to, it's just started. Uh, it's going to cover 129 nursing homes across the United States of um, Fazetin for patients in nursing homes who have tested positive uh, for coronavirus to see if we can uh, reduce their frailty and dysfunction. There are currently um, uh, a couple of, well, oh, well, a couple of dozen trials through a network that we have, a translational Jarrah Science Network, of interventions that target fundamental aging processes uh, for multiple conditions in addition to coronavirus, things like uh, frailty and Alzheimer's disease. Many of these studies are with senolytics, but some are with drugs that Nir knows very well, metformin, also uh, rapalogs. Uh, metformin partly acts by inhibiting the secretory state of senescent cells. So in conclusion, uh, the target of senolytics is senescent cells. It's not a single molecule or pathway. We have to target networks. We have to get away from the one drug, one target, one disease approach. And this developing senolytics is much more like developing antibiotics than developing an antihypertensive. We're trying to get rid of a cell type and uh, we can give these agents intermittently. Um, so uh, in most models, as I mentioned, there are about 50 conditions now that we and others have found these drugs can alleviate conditions. We're in the midst of clinical trials and I'd end with a strong note of caution that these drugs absolutely should not be used uh, by um, uh, people buying them over, over the counter or on the internet. They should not be prescribed by physicians. The only way these agents should be used is in the context of carefully controlled clinical trials. We don't know what the downsides are gonna be. Anything that sounds too good to be true usually is. There are going to be side effects that we just don't know about yet. And you know, we, we should not put these into clinical practice right now until some of these clinical trials that we're working around the clock are done. So um, thanks very much. Uh, terrific, Jim. And if you can uh, bring the screen back, um, I, I think one of the points that uh, you clearly made, and Janet, you had a sentence like that in your talk, it's not enough only to target the immune system and the inflammation. Uh, you have to have a body that will be better able to sustain a very severe disease. So you really have to uh, hit aging uh, in many ways, and you see how the senolytic itself improves frailty, right? Uh, so I, I think this is an important point. Um, let me bring in another point, and we are, uh, we're going to uh, be done soon, but um, let me just get uh, Janet's uh, reaction to this following slide. Uh, this was published in Nature, you know, last year as the epidemic went on. And it really talked about multimorbidities as a risk factor. Now, for me, multimorbidities is only, are you aging faster or are you aging slower? It's not about the comorbidities themselves. In this uh, graph that is from Europe, okay, half of the people when they're 65 have less than two diseases and half have more than two diseases. This is uh, seven, up to seven and more diseases as the color becomes uh, darker. By the way, in the United States, it's 90%, okay, because of our obesity, healthcare. Um, and so there is a chronological and biological age. And one of the things that worries me, it, although you showed data that's contradicting our, my worry, is when I count, Pfizer looked at uh, many hundreds of people over the age of 75. But when I count the multimorbidities that were not together, it looks like they had less than one comorbidity on average. And those are the people who are dying here. <laughs> are you still concerned? And, and by the way, people are asking you there in the chat about the second dose. Maybe it's an opportunity to talk about the second dose. 
Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I was um, concerned uh, for the vaccination response near, but um, mainly because, as you say, in those trials, although they had um, older adults involved, they were healthy older adults. Um, and that's why my colleagues did this study in the care home to see just what the response was like. But certainly to the Pfizer vaccine, they have responded well. Um, the second dose, yes, I've done some responses in the chat. Um, and um, I think it was one of the um, uh, people on the uh, discussion said, yeah, for Pfizer, you know, the second dose didn't make a big difference, but it did more for AZ. So there's the differences there. But yeah, I think that the concern really is once they get the disease near, that's where the uh, multimorbid do very badly. Um, and you're quite right. I think their aging has accelerated. And in, indeed, there was a study uh, published on UK Biobank data where they looked at the uh, pheno age. They used that um, aging score and the patient, the members of the UK Biobank. So they had their data before from um, when they were recruited six, seven years ago. Um, the ones that went down with severe COVID were 10 to 14 years older biologically. So I think that's that's where the concern is. You know, the vaccine, it looks like miraculously it has worked well in, in the older adults, even the multimorbid. Um, but it's when they get the disease, that's when they just really don't do well at all. And, and Janet, just a word about a, another general protector, and that's exercise. How does yeah. that affect aging and COVID? Yeah, so, so we don't know much about COVID, to be honest, really, but, um, but generally we've done studies and some of the audience may have read them in, in older adults who've um, kept up a good level of exercise um, all of their adult lives. Uh, we looked at cyclists and it was fascinating. So in these, they were 55 to 79 years old and we're just resampling them now, eight years later. So they're now what um, 63 to 87. Um, and the amazing thing was that these guys um, still had really good levels of naive T cells that you need to um, fight the, uh, the, the virus. Um, so it, it seemed to slow thymic atrophy because they had very high levels of cytokines like interleukin-7 and interleukin-15, which you need to promote your thymus. Um, but interestingly, these guys still did have um, the same levels as an, a non-exercising adults of their senescent cells. So, so those memory cells going towards senescent cells did still build up. But our prediction is that these guys will respond really well to the vaccine, even better than the non-exercising adults. And we're doing that now. So when we recall them, we're testing their response to uh, the COVID vaccine and also the flu vaccine. Uh, I want to uh, bring in something that uh, Jim mentioned, metformin. Um, and metformin, you see on the right, actually uh, hits all the targets, uh, all, all the, those hallmarks of aging, just like a senolytic does. Uh, it's interesting to note that metformin in the 1950s and 40s was used to prevent flu or treat flu and malaria. And it was then that it was discovered that it lowers glucose in diabetic patients and now we have 70, 80 years of experience as an anti-diabetic drugs. But the thing with metformin that when you give it to animals, it expands their health span and lifespan. And it's a very cheap uh, and safe drug. And for us, it's a tool um, to really target aging. Uh, it has substantial effects on, on health span. It prevents diabetes. It uh, prevents cardiovascular disease. Uh, people on metformin have less cancers, less cognitive function and Alzheimer, and they even die less than people who don't have diabetes. So it's a, a substantial drug with lots of data in, in humans. Uh, during the COVID, there are nine papers around the world showing all two things. First of all, there was less hospitalization for people on metformin. And second, there was significant less mortality. This is the last paper that was published. And you see here that the, this is the one odd. So this is increase and this is decrease uh, risk. And if you're old, you have increased risk of death. Race didn't play a role here. Gender, male die more than female, obese die more. A hypertension and insulin use didn't matter here, but people on metformin had 67% less mortality. Okay, it's just a huge uh, effect. 
Uh, similarly, in old age homes, people on metformin had uh, half of the mortality of people who were not on, on metformin. So this is another gerotherapeutic that maybe we have missed, like the statin or, or like the senolytics. We were almost there and missed it. And there are lots of efforts to be prepared for the next time. Because remember, it's not against the virus. It's fortifying the older host. That's what we need to do. Exercise, the drugs that we're talking all, all fortify the host. So it's about... COVID, it's about vaccination, but more so against the next uh, vaccine. So let me now ask each one of you to uh, give a final, final thought. What do you think is the most important thing that you're looking forward to uh, increasing the health span, short or, or long term? Uh, Jim, why don't you start? Well, our, our approach has <clears throat> been less to try to develop these drugs to, um, in a preventive way, increase health span. <clears throat> that we view as a second step. What we're using uh, these kinds of agents for across our clinical trials is to go after serious age-related conditions for which there's no good treatment uh, because we're worried about risk-benefit ratios. So that's why we're going after disorders like frailty in elderly women with a gait speed of less than 0.6 meters per second, which has a 50% two year mortality, or we're going after Alzheimer's disease, or we're going after uh, this accelerated aging syndrome in childhood cancer survivors. When they're 30 or 40, they're, they're dying of Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, et cetera. Um, we're using these, um, kinds of agents to try to rehabilitate organs from older donors before they're transplanted into younger recipients. We're actively doing this with respect to kidneys and livers. Uh, we're going after conditions, as I mentioned before, like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis for which treatments aren't good. So our, our strategy across the Translational Geroscience Network is, uh, which is a, a group of academic organizations across the uh, US that we hope to make international at some point, is to go after multiple serious conditions like this in smaller trials in parallel rather than in series to see if we can not only prevent problems, but mainly can we treat things that are currently untreatable, some of them in children. So uh, some, of the, some of these conditions, it, what, what, what we're learning from the elderly, we're applying to younger people who've had bone marrow transplants. We've found that preeclampsia is a senescence-related disease. The, the senescent cells in the placenta are having an effect on the endothelium of blood vessels in the, in the, in the, in the mother. Yeah, you know, I, uh, are we able to prevent preeclampsia uh, before the second pregnancy? Right. Uh, so I, 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 it, it's, I, I, yep. I, I think the point, the point you're making is it's not all about aging. There are certain other conditions you, you, I, I should mention HIV. I should also mention if we want to go to Mars, if this is something important for us, we have to deal with aging first because we're not going to get there without- Well, actually, actually, we have cells going up on the Axiom flight in 18 months and we're working with NASA now uh, on the Mars mission. Uh, to try to develop uh, countermeasures to radiation for these astronauts. And it isn't just radiation, zero gravity looks like it can do that. Right. Janet, your future. Yeah, so, so similar tack to Jim, really. So we're doing uh, research, trying to um, look at patients, not these older adults. They, they rarely have one condition, as Jim will know, as a geriatrician, they're multimorbid. So what we're doing is we're looking at the clustering of age-related diseases and then seeing which of the hallmarks are associated. I mean, is, is senescence going to solve everything by tackling it or do we need to go to some of the other hallmarks? So we're hoping to be able to treat multimorbid um, patients as well, because as I said, that's, that's the reality of old age. They rarely just have one thing. And, and if, I could, if I could jump in, yeah. um, Janet just made an important point, and that's going to be... Uh, because these hallmarks are interlinked, is targeting two of them less than additive, additive or synergistic? We don't know that. Yeah. That's yeah. going to be the next step. And the other next step is going to be if we combine interventions that target fundamental aging processes with disease specific interventions, mm -hmm. will we get a more than additive effect? And so far, the answer is yes in mm -hmm. animal models. So, yeah. with something like COVID, 
we may wind up with interventions much like for HIV. We're looking at senolytics there as well. But with some of these viral infections, especially chronic viruses, which COVID is turning out to cause a chronic syndrome, mm -hmm. are we gonna have to have combination therapies in older individuals? Will vaccination alone be enough? Mm -hmm. um, or are we like with HIV or some other uh, viral infections going to need combinations of agents? Yeah. Including, yeah. including, including drug gyroscience related drugs. And then the other thing here is that so Jim is looking at accelerated aging in cancer survivors. So our other tack very similar is we're actually looking at trauma survivors. So we're looking at the potential to improve outcomes because if you are a young guy, you have a major trauma, you survive it. Again, you develop the age related diseases 10 years early. So that's our accelerated aging model. So again, hoping we can do something for those guys as well. well and I, even conditions I, like I, osteoarthritis. I have to wrap up. I'm not going to talk about uh, the future in my mind. You'll have to ask me separately. Um, I saw the, the uh, um, answers coming in. By the way, one of them is for Sir Kirkland. So Sir Kirkland, you can look at the, at the question and answer specifically, but... Um, uh, you, you can see that this is just the beginning of a conversation. It's very exciting what's going on. Uh, next epidemic shouldn't be so cruel to the elderly. We should have enough tools in order to deal with that. And, and the world will really look uh, much, much different. Thank you, guys. Always a pleasure to interact with you. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all the questions, but I hope you enjoyed this conversation. And, and, and thank you, the organizer. This was very well done. Thanks. Thank you, and thank you, Noah, and thank you, Janet and James, for being here with us today. That was a great discussion and lots of questions coming in, and I think it's kind of discussions to kind of keep going throughout um, on the platform and in the chat function on the platform, so let's kind of keep the conversation going. Um, as I said, it's been a pleasure to have Janet, James, and Noah here with us today, and the next session will be starting in just under 15 minutes, and that will be a panel discussion that will be looking at the advances in novel discovery tools and delivery systems for aging science applications. So thank you everyone and I'll see you again later. Thank you.